Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Doug Kramer. I'm the company's general counsel. Um, I, I think we're set for another really great conversation. Uh, this one with Julia Chinikowski, for reasons you will find out over the next 30 minutes or so, uh, who is still mixed up with any number of things that are in the news this week and every <laughs> week, it seems. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, Julia's had a lot of time in the private sector, uh, working with Barry Diller at IAC on a number of internet and media properties for a number of years, uh, and then in 2009 was snatched uh, by President Obama to be chairman of the Federal Communications Commission, a post he held for about four years, and, and during that time really revolutionized a lot of what the FCC had, had done and, and laid the groundwork for things they're still doing today, to the point where Wired Magazine at one point named them one of the top seven uh, innovations going, which to do that with a government organization is not the easiest thing. They, they did things like, um, well, the one that I love because it's relevant again this week, they set up this thing called a, uh, working with FEMA to set up a mobile emergency alert system. <laughs> I wonder if anything's ever gonna come of that. Um, it seemed like a great idea at the time. Yeah, uh, obviously adopted the US's first net neutrality rules. We'll talk about that briefly here in a bit. Uh, set up incentive auctions to deal with broadcast and wireless spectrums and, and, and all sorts of different things. Um, since he left the FCC, he now works with the Carlisle Group uh, as a, a, a principal and managing director on a number of different technology and media uh, investments they're involved with and serves on various boards of companies like Sonos and MasterCard and, and things like that. So, Julius, thanks for being here uh, Great to with be us here. today. Uh, so we are going to tackle no smaller uh, of a topic than what the U.S. is going to do about technology regulation. <laughs> and so I have good news and bad news on that front. Uh, the good news is we have found the one area where both parties in Washington, D.C. can agree, uh, which otherwise seems impossible in this day and age. The bad news is, is that one area is that they both think that there should be some significant regulation of the Internet um, and have all sorts of ideas of how that's going to happen. So my first question uh, and, and first thing I want to talk to you about, Julius, is what is your sense, you know, being in D.C., having had the experience you've had, of, of what you think that U.S. regulators, Congress, the agencies, all of that, what, what do you think they're setting out to do when it comes to the internet, uh, out of all yeah. of this activity? That's a good question. First of all, uh, it, it's great to be here. I've, I've watched Cloudflare for a number of years, uh, uh, got to know Matthew and Michelle uh, just about at the beginning. Uh, and if I had been able to come to the first of the internet summits, yes my answer to this question would have been very different. Uh, Matthew kept on scheduling these on Jewish holidays, and so I had to <laughs> keep on, well, I know I can't. <laughs> so finally, Matthew, thank you. <laughs> uh, but in this area, the, the, the shift in Washington has been really clear and really stark. So you know, when, I, when Obama was running and I was working on that campaign, when I was at the FCC as recently as the first Cloudflare Internet Summit, there was a bipartisan consensus in Washington on this stuff, and it was very pro Silicon Valley pro tech and people who disagreed with each other on some issues would try to annoy the other side by trying to paint them as anti Silicon Valley and anti tech. And, and, and the world has shifted. And you see leaders in both parties talking about uh, the need to regulate tech in a whole series of ways. So, what's happened? You know, nothing secret really. Uh, the manipulation of the election has been a factor, all the cyber and privacy breaches have been a factor. I think at some level even uh, parents worried about their kids being addicted to their mobile devices has been a factor. Uh, and then the, the growing size of the success, most successful internet companies has been a factor. And this thing, you know, you can tell a lot by how people use language. And for a long time, people referred to Facebook and Amazon and Google and Netflix, you know, as Fang or Fanga, right? Uh, now people refer to them as the digital giants. Yeah. And, you know, if you're in a regulatory environment and you're referred to as a giant, uh, th there's probably a f another side to that coin when it comes to how Washington thinks about you. Yeah. Well, let's go down that one. Let's go down that, that first. When you think about you know, competition policy or the way that um, when, you, when you make that switch to being a giant or, or, or something that raises those concerns. In this industry, when you have on the one hand, um, you know, content or, or transmission or telecoms and then, and then on the other hand, you know, you know, internet companies and tech companies, where, where we're starting to see combinations that blur some of those lines, how would you all think about those combinations and, yeah. and what was problematic for you all and, and to what extent do you think that, 
uh, Washington may be on that same path or, or maybe deviating from that yeah. path a bit? It's, you know, it, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit of a student of history, not as much a student of history as Richard Tedlow, who I think is, is, is here, but uh, if you go back decades and think about communications businesses and regulatory policy, there's been a, a recurring cycle that happens again and, and again. And, and the cycle is uh, uh, a new entrant comes along, tries to intrude on the turf of some established player, the established player pushes back, uh, tries to use the levers of government to help restrain innovation and competition. And then it's usually a little bit sloppy, but overall the government's done a pretty good job of actually landing on the side of new entrants and innovators. And so a couple of examples are interesting. One, uh, think about telephone service. Uh, obviously we started with a, a, a monopoly, we broke that up into regional monopolies. Uh, and then along same came some innovators who said, you know what, we can deliver telephone service wirelessly and mobily. And wouldn't that be a good idea? Uh, well, not surprisingly, the incumbent telco said, hmm, maybe, but I guess you should give us a couple of licenses and markets and let us do it. And in fact, the first thing the FCC did was just that. They let the incumbents do that and didn't lead to really rapid innovation in mobile. But eventually the FCC got smart and said, you know what, we're going to issue some more licenses to get mobile service out there, and we're not going to let the incumbents get those licenses. Uh, very important development. Similarly in that area, uh, some innovators developed unlicensed, the, use, the, the ability to use uh, Spectrum in an unlicensed manner, right? Without getting too technical, uh, there, there are two basic models, most of you know this, for how Spectrum is put on the market. Uh, license for exclusive use, this is how AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, get their licenses, they typically pay for them for, at auction, and unlicensed, completely different model, no one has exclusivity, anyone, you know, innovators can do what they want, and this has given us Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and a whole series yep. of other innovations. Well, just on, on the story, when that technology came along, you know, if you had predicted that the establishment telcos would resist the FCC from authorizing unlicensed use, you would have been right. The good news is over time the FCC uh, uh, did authorize a very significant amount of unlicensed use. I'll do a couple of more things on, on this, because it is interesting. Uh, broadcast TV, so on the media side, many of us uh, grew up with just having broadcast TV, and then the pioneers of the cable industry came along and said, hey, we have a crazy idea. We're gonna string coax cable everywhere in the country and give you a lot more choices for your television. Massive capital investment, a lot of risk, uh, interesting technology, and they actually went ahead uh, and started trying to do that, and consistent with this theme, the incumbent broadcast industry in various ways tried to slow them down. Mm -hmm. Slow them down at the FCC, slow them down in Congress, slow them down with local franchise authorities. Uh, eventually, the FCC landed on the side of the cable new entrants and said, you know what, this is good for innovation, good for competition. Um, it's interesting now because the, that, the cable infrastructure, uh, which the FCC helped promote to get out there, was originally designed for TV, but eventually became our core infrastructure for internet. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, a, a nice unanticipated consequence, but consistent with this cycle that I've described, as the cable industry has gotten larger, and you know, the next generation of innovators and new competitors came along and said, oh, we can use this internet to compete with the traditional TV yeah. industry, and to do other things. Well, you know, you, you wouldn't be shocked if you knew this history to discover that the cable companies and broadband providers tried to push back. This is what the net neutrality debate is about. And, you know, net neutrality is simply consistent with these other examples that I mentioned of the government saying, hmm, uh, there are artificial blocks or potential blocks to a new entrant, a new innovator, a new competitor uh, succeeding, and we should make sure that they have a fair chance to compete in the, in the marketplace. Yeah. So if, if you've got, you know, sort of those ISP providers, you know, on, on the one hand, who are maybe at odds with sort of the, the tech innovative, you know, even the tech giants that have come up and innovated behind them, wh where do you see the next wave of innovation? Is there still enough oxygen? Is there still enough space? Or as the tech giants sort of, I don't know, calcify or do whatever they might do as, as they get, get big, do you still think that there is enough room and opportunity and fuel for new disruptive innovations behind all of that? And if so, where do you think that comes from? Yeah, I, I mean, I, listen, I'm, 
I'm an optimist. I, I, I used to be more of an optimist, and now I'm watching what's going on in Washington, so I'm having to reconsider that a little <laughs> bit. But uh, uh, I think there are a couple of interesting things going on. One is, uh, like, the first point one has to make in this is that um, if you go back 30 years and looked at the people who answered these questions, you know, usually the next great innovation was something that was completely unanticipated. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a government regulator or doing government policy, you want to think about um, things like, do we have the right infrastructure where innovators can potentially develop things? So it you know, gets you to wanting to have universal high-speed broadband wired and wireless, things like that. Um, I think we're in a really I interesting time in history because of the emergence of more than just one or two large, well-capitalized, innovative technology companies uh, that are each doing something where they have a competitive advantage, but also each more and more competing with the others, right? And so you have Google, and you have Facebook, and you have Apple, uh, uh, etc. Uh, if you take a step back in a broader lens, you have Alibaba, you have Tencent. Uh, I can't remember if I mentioned Amazon, but you have you know, a number of really large companies that are largely unconstrained by their own balance sheets mm -hmm. uh, that have tons of brilliant engineers who are really competing and pushing each other. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then in the traditional communications area in the U in, around the world, certainly in the US, it's sort of an odd thing where you have uh, cable, you know, those companies are all global. Mm -hmm. Cable companies in the US are regional. Wireless companies are national. And, uh, you know, the, the, the world is changing in a significant yeah. way. If the question is, uh, is it getting harder for new entrepreneurs and innovators to uh, enter and compete with all of these digital giants? Yeah, I think, I think it is. Yeah. Um, I think it is. And, and so availability, if you listen to Jeff Immelt, the availability of funding certainly isn't the problem for right. these folks. But, but are, are there any particular structural obstacles that you would sort of be targeted in, and making sure that, that, you know, either get knocked down or never get stood up in the first place to, to those new innovators? Anything we should be looking for in that well, space? I think, I think we're early in being able to answer this question, right? So this gets to, your, to the, the first question that you, that you asked. Um, uh, if you look at each of the different large internet tech companies, they have some very real advantages that anyone in the marketplace understands, wow, you know, uh, whether it's Google and Search or, you know, Amazon with AWS or other things, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty significant market position they have. What do we do about it? The what do we do about it is really hard. I, I found one of the things that I found when I was at the FCC was that uh, it's pretty easy to figure out what to do if you're looking at an a part of the market where there are low barriers to entry and really robust competition, it's easy to figure out what to do, not much. And then there's a lot of literature on what you do as a regulator if you believe that the industry you're looking at is a monopoly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you ask the question that I asked, okay, well, what if you're dealing with markets of imperfect competition, mm -hmm. where you have, you know, more than one player, so you can't say it's a monopoly, but you see real advantages. You see challenges, um, you know, some barriers to entry. Ha what, is, what is a set of principles that one can bring to uh, ensuring that new entrants have a chance to develop uh, and go to the market with new innovations without unfairly slowing down companies, which by themselves are competing globally? So I think it's a hard set of questions. What you're seeing in Washington now is some frustration by the size and the apparent power, but not a lot of really good ideas on the competition um, piece of it on how to, on how to handle it. Okay. So I want to switch gears uh, to something that I think is an incredibly significant change in this area um, from when you, even when you were serving at the commission. So on, on, you know, when, when you were there, 2009, 2011, <laughs> not only was there a bit more of a virtuous sort of approach to tech and, and what was going on out here, but really you had the field largely to yourself. And, and what the FCC might do, certainly they would have to work with the FTC and the Hill and all that, but the American position on what this market should look like, how it should be regulated, really was by and large adopted around the world. And, and now you've got, you know, with, with some exceptions, largely uh, the, the tech giants are, are US-based companies. That certainly is not the case anymore, right? In, in the past couple of years, we have seen 
predominantly in Europe, but in a number of other countries as, as well, a, a, a new and, and varied group of significant regulations that are going to hit internet companies. And for reasons you explained before, how it is a global marketplace, you know, those lines and, and, and the application of those regulations gets blurred. So, so what sort of, I mean, obviously this brings complications, but, but how do you think that that plays out? Is, is there some way that this gets harmonized or does it just become a race to the bottom with, with all the different jurisdictions competing against each other for their own interests? What, what, what do you see happening in that space? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. And you can, you can throw in a third leg of the stool too, right? So you have the US, you have Europe, and you have what's going on in China. Mm -hmm. And then you have, uh, you, and the fourth leg would be India. Yes. Um, uh, it's, so it's a very difficult set of challenges. You know, in a uh, world that is impossible, uh, you'd have one set of consistent rules that apply to everyone everywhere around the world. Uh, that's not what's going to happen. Um, couple of, one point about Europe, just to, to start this. I, I've been watching Europe really closely on this. Part of the reason was when I took over at the FCC in 2009, uh, the U.S. was behind Europe on mobile. So for those of you who are old enough to remember 3G, the US was behind on 3G, and Europe was ahead. And so one of the big US policy goals, Obama talked about this, I spent a lot of time on this, was you know, the US really should lead the world in 4G LTE. And, um, and that, worked out, uh, that worked out pretty well. You see this debate happening now in, yeah. uh, in 5G. Uh, and there were some uh, regulatory decisions made in Europe, made in the U.S. that contributed to the U.S. actually being ahead in, in, in 3G. The details aren't that important. What I did notice when I was at the FCC 2009 to 2013 as the American internet companies started to grow uh, significantly and started to be pushing a lot of data through a lot of pipes, uh, there was a lot of pushback in Europe starting with the European telcos, mm -hmm. who were struggling at that point, uh, blaming all their problems on the US-based internet content companies that European consumers really like to consume. Yeah. And it always struck me as a little bit odd because uh, rather than the European companies saying, oh, our internet consumers here really seem to like this stuff, surely there's a business model in here somewhere uh, they wanted to convince the regulators to figure out how to, how to push back on the American uh, companies. And so what we're, some of what we're seeing now has actually been talked about and debated in, in, in Europe for a long time. And as we in the U.S. had this um, uh, give the Internet companies a lot of room to maneuver approach, Europe had a different approach. But, but to your point, they clearly put... Uh, rules in place now uh, uh, on, on privacy is, is, you know, GDPR is probably the leading uh, example. Um, uh, and it may end up being a good thing. GDPR is imperfect, uh, but the idea that there should be some clear rules of road in place is not a crazy idea. I think it's also not a crazy idea to have different parts of the world uh, governments in different parts of the world compete a little bit on what the best regulatory approach is. Uh, you know, is it this approach to privacy or is it a different approach to privacy? It's not bad to have some laboratories of experimentation. I think we're seeing some of that now. People are looking at Europe, people, like privacy. People are looking at California. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the marketplace, what consumers think, what businesses think. Uh, so I don't think we'll get to, uh, you know, complete uniform national rules, although so, so, so many of the businesses see the frustrations of dealing with different local rules wherever they operate, that uh, th there will be people in all of the different governments saying to the extent we can have consistency, that would be better. China might be a little bit different for its own reasons. Um, so these are all in great deep cuts. I, I, I feel I will be uh, in a lot of trouble out here if I don't let you play your free bird. <laughs> and that is to, to talk to you about net neutrality. Okay, so um, you mentioned briefly before you, you, attitude and approach to net neutrality. Obviously, um, since you left and with the new administration, uh, the commission's view on that and rules on that are changing. How do you see this as someone who has lived this and also has a pretty good perspective? How do you see this playing out? Are we just left with this pendulum where uh, 
you know, one administration will have one set of rules and then we have to be ready on election day to switch to the other set of rules. Um, is there some consensus that you think could yeah. be uh, reached here? H how do people who want to make long-term investments in sort of making, you know, this industry work well uh, deal with that? And, and where does your crystal ball see that going? Yeah, I think the pendulum is, is mostly awful because it doesn't allow companies and innovators to plan as effectively as they should. And I, I tried really hard to avoid that. I was committed to putting in place the country's first net neutrality rules, but, but I thought that how we did that was as important as the fact that we did that. Uh, there are other areas of the FCC where pro-competition rules over time, pro-innovation rules had, had, had been bipartisan rules, mm -hmm. uh, very healthy for all the players in the industry. Uh, and even though net neutrality in 2009 was already a highly polarized issue, you know, you had uh, CEOs of telcos saying, these are our wires, we're going to do whatever we want with it. And you had, you know, groups on the left that had already organized. But my goal was still to try to find a way for there to be a broad consensus on what the rules should be so that we could move on. And, uh, and we worked it really hard. And we ended up with a set of uh, net neutrality rules, uh, not particularly complicated, right? No blocking, yeah. no throttling. Yeah no unreasonable discrimination, uh, where we had a really broad consensus uh, supported by Silicon Valley, smaller companies, VCs, larger companies, supported by the cable industry, the AT&T, uh, supported by everyone except for one company, uh, Verizon, which ultimately decided to sue. And Verizon's decision to sue is what led to the, yeah. the thing just not uh, resolving itself. Um, but I do think something good came out of that, you know, year plus of getting people from different parts of these different industries in a room together to try to work out uh, zones of agreement. Because I think that the, uh, the we succeeded, I think, in shifting the debate. Because uh, the, the industry, the ISPs, even Verizon that sued, ended up agreeing um, in a, with the principles of net neutrality. You know, most of them supported actual rules, but they all agreed that, well, the ISPs shouldn't do this, this, and the other thing. And the reason I think that that's important is that um, when that is the social norm, number one, and then number two, you can reasonably predict that the rules in place will go back and forth depending on who's in power, mm -hmm. you end up with a pendulum affecting the rules, yeah. but a little bit less so the actual practices in the marketplace because the companies understand that, in this case, the Democrats will come back to power mm -hmm. and they, they want to have a certain level of caution. They also understand that consumers are paying attention uh, and they don't want to have a backlash. So I think it'd be better just to have uh, some consistent resolution. I think, I think there's some chance, you know, maybe after the midterms that there's uh, legislation that's adopted that's sensible, that's bipartisan, that, uh, that works to put the issue behind us. Yep. Okay. But that's net neutrality. Okay, so before we get to everybody's questions, I'm gonna ask you one follow-up and, and, and ask you, give me sort of the 10-word answer or, 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 or fewer, whatever. And that is, so, 2020 comes around, we, we elect a Democratic president. They say, let's just get Julius back in here, run the, <laughs> run the whole thing back. Uh, you go into your office, the FCC. What do you do about net neutrality on day one? What, what's your approach at that point when, when you're back in power in light of everything you just said? Yeah, I think the short answer is I'd, uh, I'd announce that we were putting you know, rules into effect. I'd also go to the Hill to try to work out um, some legislation so that it wouldn't have to be done at the FCC because there are a bunch of legal problems. Uh, not to give away my tricks, and, and you know, but I'd, I'd probably announce uh, that the FCC would adopt a pretty extreme set of rules to create the conditions for uh, sure. some sensible legislation. Absolutely, very good. Okay, well, we've got a couple minutes for questions, so if you have questions, raise your hand, and helpful folks with microphones will grab you. So, yeah. Go ahead. I have a question about what? Uh, se let's see. We have seven billion IoT devices, mm. uh, or maybe ten. It's hard to predict, and none of them are regulated. There's no equipment uh, acceptance 
program. They're all connected to this common resource. When will the FCC step up to the plate and think about network cleanliness and resilience, which has been its responsibility since the start of the telephone network? Why yeah. is it different now? It's, no, it's a great question. I think, I think you're right. Uh, uh, with, with one exception, uh, the, those devices uh, actually all have an FCC stamp on them. For their radius. Sorry? For their radius. Exactly. So all those devices go through the FCC. I think, this, I think you're raising a really big and important issue where we have all these devices out there that, that don't meet what any set of standards that a smart people sat around and said, all right, you know, what are the basic standards we would want here uh, for cyber, for resiliency, for everything else? So I think that's right. I, 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 if I were at the FCC now, I would certainly press the authority that the FCC had to try to do something about that. I'm not sure if the authority is just limited to regulating RF frequencies, but there are all sorts of things you can do to bring industry together, to do some standard setting. Uh, but I'd be on that really aggressively because I think you're right, and it's just so obvious, and it's, um, uh, it's, it's a large, important, scary area that's not getting enough attention anywhere in government so right now. In a lot of these discussions with IoT devices, it often comes up, you know, there should be a, a certification, a good housekeeping seal, something like that. Yeah. Do you want to claim that territory for your friends at the FCC? They want to they take that on? I, I, do you I, think that's, a, that's an option? Uh, I think it is an option. Yeah. I think it is an option. Good, sure. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, so... Um, the United States has one of the lower speeds of broadband, and we largely have a monopoly, a, a duopoly of, of telcos and, and cable, plus now wireless. Um, and they're basically trying to do rent-seeking, maximize the amount of money on their, uh, on, on the, that they're receiving on their investment. Uh, at one point in time, it seemed that comp CLEX, competitive local exchange carriers, yeah. were the answer. How do we actually increase broadband speed and, and make it so that, so that uh, Net neutrality isn't isn't really an imperative because there's enough bandwidth out there, so that doesn't matter. Yeah, it's a great question, and you're right that you know if you had robust competition to the home for broadband, you wouldn't necessarily need net neutrality regulations. I agree with you on that. Uh, uh, we we can debate you know w whether the U.S. should get a yellow light or a red light on broadband speeds overall, uh, but it, it it should be better and 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 stronger. And I think there's I'm disappointed. I think a lot of people are disappointed that competition in broadband to the to the home didn't develop in the way that that people had hoped. You know, Verizon had FiOS, a uh, great fiber network, but they pulled back in most markets from actually competing with cable. There, there are there's a company that's overbuilding cable in a number of markets. The RCN combined with some other companies, and in those, uh, I, I think it's probably the case that. Uh, in markets where there are at least two players competing, you get better speeds and service than where there's only one player. Uh, it is a problem. Th there are some people who have a great amount of hope for what the wireless companies might be able to do with high frequency, you know, the new high frequency spectrum that's being put out there. I hope that's the case. You know, I, I do... An interesting learning for me was that a bunch of technology truths that I was told when I was at the FCC turned out not to be right. You know, so like a lot of engineers told me that, say, satellites would never be able to have really fast, low latency internet. And that turned out to be wrong. And at the time, people were saying, you know, these super high frequencies will never be any good for anything. Oh, it turns out that's probably wrong. Uh, even in that world, though, it's hard to imagine that being a solution for, for rural areas, you know, it, more, more of a solution in, in dense areas. So uh, it, it, I'll, I'll, I'll stop at this point, but there's, it's, it's, it's a really important area and we have a lot more to do. Well, very good. Well, I, I want us all to, to thank Julius not only for being here today, I want to thank him on behalf of all of us for our, our, our texts from President Trump, both yesterday uh, and going forward, and, and best of luck with everything you do. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Doug. <laughs>